Good morning, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Friday Morning at the Fun House with Pardo and Martin Popoff. Uh, good morning, Martin. How are you today? Yes, morning. Doing doing well. Thanks very much. <laughs> It's a chilly day here in New York, really, really chilly, but we've got a very cheery and bright and I think fun topic here for everybody. Uh, we're going to talk about yeah. perfect albums. So <clears throat> these are like those albums that you play every song, start to finish, no desire to skip any song. You may have heard these albums millions of times, but they never get old. Production's great. The songs are great. The musicianship is great. They mixed with hit songs and great deep album cuts, kind of the little bit of everything, right? And uh, so Martin and I have been talking about this one for a little over a week, and we talked about a lot of albums, and then eventually you start weeding it down to five because, you know, an album you may think is perfect, then all of a sudden you think about it a little bit more, and you're like, well... That one song I kind of like, right? Well, to me, that automatically discounts it, right? Because you've got to love every yeah. song and you never want to <laughs> skip every song. So I think uh, me personally, my, my original list was 10. And then we, we didn't want to duplicate any albums here. So then I started looking at the list. I'm like, well, yeah, that album, love it. But there's a one dicey track, right? Or maybe the two dicey tracks. And... Yeah. I have my top five pretty settled. Martin's got his pretty settled. We could easily probably do a follow-up to this because I think I have enough for another show that I also would qualify maybe, or maybe it's the 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 also rans, right? The the perf the kind of perfect, not quite so perfect, but my my top five I'm pretty happy with. And uh and I, I love Martin's pick picks as well. So I'm gonna have Martin start us off with his number five and give any clarification you want on why you pick these and you know what your um yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was a great description. I mean, that, that literally covered, covered all the bases of what has to, you know, has to happen for these to qualify. I mean, some of them, you feel a little bit of a weakness in the steel, right. Of, uh, of, uh, of a couple of the criteria here and there or whatever. And I, yeah, funny thing was I had to, you know, I begged you to, to trade one to me. I wanted to see your final five and then hoping like, I, I didn't say which ones I would have wanted off your five, but I said, give me your five. And uh, I may take one of the ones you uh, toss away, depending, because there were two there that I thought were really, you know, really. You were like two kids with like baseball cards, you know, it's like, well, you know, would yeah, you, yeah. you want to trade that Reggie Jackson exactly. for, uh, you know, the Carl yeah. Ripley? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, okay. So uh, to, to get going here, uh, my number five, I went with this record here. Never mind the bollocks. Here's the Sex Pistols. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they only made the one record. There was there was eventually this thing, but it's more of a compilation or whatever. You know, when when you when you brought up this topic, this was the first thing that came to mind, and a lot of a lot of interesting sort of thoughts uh, went through my mind about the idea of a perfect album. Because when we were kids, the first thing that we thought of, we had this whole ranking system with uh, average, average good, lousy good, really good, so so lousy, and all this, and it was all based on heaviness. And we had this idea of the perfect album. The first one that ever came along was Rainbow Rising, where every single song was heavy. And then this this was what next, uh, along with uh, Let There Be Rock. And then there were the Motorhead albums, essentially, even the first one, actually, uh, but the second and third, all of them, right? So so this idea of, of every song being heavy on an album was our first idea of a perfect album. Um, but I've had been having a lot of discussions lately with, with people about Rainbow Rising and then people saying, oh, do you close your eyes and starstruck and run with a the wolf? There's a little bit of a drop off. So can you really, you know, I think most people would say that would be OK and I would have picked. But this this, you know, everything on here is uh, is just an anthem. Everything is heavy. It's not particularly punky. It's it's a it's a well recorded, you know, multi tracked guitars, super heavy album with those with those hooligan background vocals and stuff. This album scared the pants off of us in 1977. I was 14 at the time. Um, but all these songs, you know, I mean, everything on here is is just a well put together. Uh, it's a hit. Every song's a hit. Um, you know, you might say something like, I remember as a kid, we thought 17 was just a little too poppy. Um, and uh, and on this one, we've got uh, on on the uh, on the Canadian copy, we got submission, which wasn't on the UK copy. My original was a UK of this, but uh, but yeah, I mean, there's there's no fall down point on this whole thing. I mean, in in a sense, it is a collection of singles. Uh, everything is really well done. So it it's it's 
a little antithetical to the whole idea of punk. And everybody's talked about that many times about how, I mean, every, you know, every metalhead more or less loves this album. Everybody who made records in the, in the eighties and you, and you see lots of covers of sex pistol songs and all that stuff. So um, yeah, easily the best punk album of all time on most people's list is definitely a non-contrarian choice. I mean, this is the first one that comes to mind pretty much for everybody as uh, the greatest punk album of all time. And it went gold in the States. So uh, there you go. My number one pick, uh, my number five pick actually. Cool. And uh, yeah, I mean, to kind of go off on the um, kind of like the rainbow rising kind of tangent a little bit um, was also one that I considered. And, and Martin and I talked a couple days ago about how this list doesn't necessarily have to be the, our favorite albums from these bands or even maybe in our top 10 favorite albums of all time. And I will say like, I have many times and I still do list Rainbow Rising as one of my favorite albums of all time. And like uh, In Rock and Machine Head from Deep Purple and the White Snake 87 album. And, you know, we can go on and on and on. And ironically, <clears throat> you're not gonna see any of those on my list because I think an album like Rainbow Rising is a perfect example of an album that is so beloved maybe for half the album or a little bit more than half the album because those songs are so great. Not that we don't like Do You Close Your Eyes and, and all those other songs because they're, they're fine. But I think for me, Rainbow Rising, there's like three songs on there, four songs on there that are, I just love them to death and it elevates that album. But is it absolutely perfect from start to finish? Maybe not quite. Doesn't really need to be because it's the legendary album that it is for the reasons that we just said. So yeah, I mean, where I think some of the albums that I have on my list here are either number one or number two of my favorites from those bands. I mean, there are there are albums that I would rank higher on my list of favorite albums of all time that I'm not even gonna talk about today because there's one or two tracks maybe that, you know, don't really do it yeah. for me or, you know, never really liked or maybe got tired of or whatever the reason is. So my number okay. five, <clears throat> I'm going to go, uh, and this, uh, of all the ones on my list, this is probably the only album that was not really a big seller because, you know, there can be a perfect album that, you know, half the universe never heard, right? So that's totally fine. Uh, this is one of them, probably way less than half the universe hasn't heard this. Uh, released in 1987, produced by Paul O'Neill. Uh, I just remember my entire world got turned upside down in 87 with this, with the White Snake 87 album and this one. Uh, it's Hall of the Mountain King by Sabotage. I mean, it's, and it's the heaviest album on my list. And it is just a, for me, an absolutely perfect metal album. It's a perfect sabotage album. And it's uh, an album that, you know, how many years ago was 87? Long time ago. I still listen to this a lot this day. And every single song is killer. I mean, it starts off at 24 hours ago. It ends with devastation and everything in between. It's, it's like, you know, the perfect sandwich or the perfect uh, Oreo cookie, right? Where it's like, you love that you love that the, the bread is, is nice and soft and all that wonderful stuff in the middle, just absolutely delicious. Put it all together and you've got a delectable meal. Well, that's what this is for me. And just so many great songs on here, you know, Strange Wings, Title Track, The Price You Pay, White Witch, Legions, Beyond the Doors of the Dark. Uh, John Oliva, best vocal performance of his career on this album, in my opinion. His brother, Chris Oliva, amazing riffs, amazing solos, the thunderous rhythm section, catchy songs, though, but really heavy. So you remember, like 1987, you know, thrash is getting very, very popular, right? You know, all of a sudden, metal is starting to get really, really heavy. I think these guys were very listenable, but still the music appealed to that growing underground of that, you know, much more extreme music. And I think uh, this had all those qualities and it, you know what, it holds up really well all these years later. So uh, that's my number five, Hole of the Mountain King by Sabotage. Uh, wonderful stuff. Yeah, that's great. And, and, and such a great example of this whole thing, because I, I would, I would say Sirens is my favorite album of theirs and it's very, very close to fitting this thing. And so was Power of the Night. And then, and then this would be the, those three go together in the EP uh, essentially as, as just what, what a great band. I mean, Sirens was blew my mind when it came out. I, I absolutely it was, agree. It was, yeah. It was instantly one of my favorite albums of all time. But then, you know, people always talk about, uh, did Sabotage do anything new? No, they didn't. Uh, did Iron Maiden do anything new? No, they didn't, right? Um, you know, you can, you can also have really amazing, amazing bands and great albums that, that are just instantly rise to the top of everybody's list. 
that don't invent a new kind of music. And I, I thought Sabotage was kind of like that. It was just, it was just the, the, the next level of perfection af, after like, like what Priest was doing in the seventies when Sirens came out. And then, yeah. and then Leia, like you say, they, they came back with this with a vengeance after, after the, you know, the ill-advised whole debacle with Fight for the Rock, right? Yeah, they totally did. And then even with the next album with Gutter Ballet and then Streets, I mean, all of a sudden then they started incorporating, you know, other things, you know, maybe that influence from Queen, right? And adding that to metal. And I think that also kind of uh, really helped this band go in another direction. But yeah, what a great band. And, you know, you talk about like influential. I mean, in your first pick, you know, the Sex Pistols, whether you like that style of music or not. I mean, Jesus, look what that kind of spearheaded for uh, all sorts of other bands coming after it, you know? So, uh, yeah. Great cool. stuff. All right. All right. So my next one uh, does actually fit this idea of um, it, it does fall into favorite album of all time, um, you know, be, because that will be a tendency with a perfect album. It could be your favorite album of all time pretty easily. And, and so I went with this record here, Sabotage, one of the coolest things I have in my office here, because that's a fully signed Sabotage, right? Um, but uh, so I do call this my favorite album of all time. And I wanted to put this in here for the reason that um, lately I've, uh, I've, I've been in little debates with people and arguments with people. Um, you know, everybody always points to Super Czar, Super Czar, uh, and Am I Going Insane, Bracket Radio, as, uh, as the fall down points on this record. And when I think of this record now as being my favorite album of all time, Super Czar has been rising in my estimation so much over the years as just such a cool thing to put on a record. I, I just thought this proggy thing with the bells and the choirs and, and everything, I, I, I actually think it's, it's, it's well within the middle of the pack now on this album for me. And I, I never get tired of Am I Going Insane either. It's just such a weird, wacky song. So there are no boring ballads on here. There's nothing slow and boring although there is slow of course uh with the writ um but everything else on here hole in the sky symptom megalomania thrill of it all the writ are are in my top you know 12 favorite sabbath songs of all time pretty much and don't start too late is that cool little bit of um you know spanish guitar on on here so yeah no, nothing nothing for me now is a fall down on this as a kid am i going insane and super czar we did kind of skip as kids but now i just understand them and love both of them so much more and how integrated they are in it and and when it is your favorite album of all time it can bring along every everything else on it in you know in a sense of enthusiasm so there you go. And, and I almost, I almost went with, um, you know, the, there's more uniformity across something like a heaven and hell and mob rules. And, and you and I talked about that, um, you know, as we were getting set for this, you, you could almost go for some of, some of those kinds of records fitting in here, but, uh, but I am bored by one song each on those, on those two records. So it, it kind of, uh, <laughs> that it, it disqualified it. So there you go. Sabotage. Yeah, Sabbath is problematic for me in this discussion because, you know, they're my one of my favorite bands of all time. But and, and all the I mean, all right, even the two D, the first two Dio albums and all the classic ones with Ozzy, there's at least one song I really don't care for on every one of those albums. Right. Like, Am I Going Insane? Don't really care for that. I was never a fan of that. Rest of the album is amazing. Volume four is my favorite Sabbath album of all time. But I never need to hear changes again. Quite frankly, was never really a big fan of that. Uh, plus it's got the little sound effects thing, you know, whatever, if we're going to yeah. count that. Uh, Paranoid, never, I was never a big fan of Planet Caravan, right? Uh, you know, you got like one track on Master Reality. The first album's got one track that I'm like, and on. I would, for me, probably the only Sabbath album. And you know what? Mob Rules is pretty close to a perfect album for me. That's pretty close. I, as much as I love Heaven and Hell, there's, you know, Wishing Well, Lady Evil, probably the weaker tunes on that album. Uh, I think Sabbath Bloody Sabbath is pretty damn close. Although Who Are You, not a huge fan of that. The rest of the album kills. So I think Sabbath and even Purple to an extent too, my two favorite bands of all time, even they're my favorite albums for them. There's probably at least one track that I'm like kind of on the fence about. Yeah. I, I like, I don't love Right. So that's why I really struggled with this, because a part of me was like, well, you know, how can I not put my two favorite bands, at least one album from each on this list? But, you know, if we're being true to what this the intent of the show is and this concept is, it, it just didn't work. Right. They kind of bubble right underneath. It's funny. I, I almost could put technical ecstasy on this because 
Yeah, I, I just <laughs> every single thing on there, even even all the way down to the likes of She's Gone or It's All Right or, you know, the mellow ones that you're supposed to not like. I mean, I just I just think everything on that because it's just it's just a frame of mind that they're in by the late 70s. It, it just you just you're just buying everything that they're doing. That's that's the other thing about perfect albums. I think sometimes is, is when you are when you basically have the massive confidence in whatever they're doing. Where, where your brain is telling you, I'm not supposed to like this song, but they're geniuses. They know what they're doing. I'm, I'm going with it because they're right and I'm wrong. You know, so sometimes there's a little bit of that to the perfect album, right? Yeah, yeah. With me, Technical Ecstasy, half of it I love, the other half um, right. I'm nuts <laughs> about. I tried. I mean, I love the band, obviously, and I bought yeah. it, you know, back uh, just, yeah. um, you know, and Never Say Die is a whole other story. We, we've talked about that one before. Yeah. But I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, but a perfect example of what you're talking about. Also, uh, let's look at Come Taste the Band by Deep Purple, right? Mm. Um, <clears throat> on the surface should be an album that a lot of us don't really like. And but I think as a fan, I was always like, all right. I love everything these guys do. I really should like this album. And then you know what? The more you got kind of listened to it, got into it, it's like, yeah, they were right. This is a really good album. It's a different lineup. You got the major character of the band is gone, got someone new. They obviously went to great lengths to find the guy they thought was the right choice. And I think with time, an album like Cub Taste the Band for me has really aged exceptionally well hmm. um, and is one of the stronger albums from the band in that decade i think but uh yeah. back in the back in the day would anybody have said that probably not <clears throat> subconsciously it's aged well because of that album cover right the fine wine oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> they knew what they were doing martin <laughs> right right yeah <laughs> all right so uh my number four uh it's funny i was actually when I was taking a shower this morning, I was thinking about this album and this pick, and I was thinking how this album is a perfect example of uh, an album where you have, and we're going back to the, the vinyl days, right? Because we all bought this on vinyl back in the day, where you had the one side, side A, is all the big popular hit songs that everybody remembers. And side B kind of got forgotten. And now all these years later, for those of us who grew up with this album and have played it a million times, mm -hmm. for me anyway, I gravitate more towards side two, which is actually, you know, all contains all the hidden gems on the album and makes this album a perfect collection of hits and really, really strong deep cuts. And I'm talking about Moving Pictures by Rush. I mean, from that Terry Brown production to the masterful musicality of the whole thing, I mean, you've got that amazing instrumental in YYZ. You've got the big hit in Tom Sawyer. You've got the kind of second hit in Limelight, uh, the favorite crowd pleaser in Red Barchetta. And then you've got those three songs on, on side two, right? You've got the Camera Eye, which is their big proggy epic on the album. You've got Witch Hunt, which is so heavy and dark and foreboding. And then you got this funny song, which back in the day I didn't like called Vital Signs, because that was so weird. It was so different from Rush, and it kind of foreshadowed a lot of stuff they were going to do later on. But now, like for me, Vital Signs is one of the coolest songs on this album because it's just so freaking different and just really catchy and really intelligent, I think, the way they crafted that song and the arrangement and everything like that. And that it's just like, I mean, you go Tom Sawyer, Red Barchetta, YYZ, Limelight, Camera Eye, Witch Hunt, Vital Signs. Man, it doesn't get much better than that. And, you know, there may be other Rush albums that maybe have more of an impact. I mean, you know, and, uh, you know, you look at Hemispheres or 2112. I mean, all these albums by Rush are just, you know, pretty damn solid start to finish, bordering on greatness. But there's something about this album that's just, I think the band just absolutely kind of hit that little pot of gold, that little bit of magic. And it's just sprinkled all throughout all of these songs. And I think this album... We all know why we loved it back in the day, but I think for me anyway, I love it even more today because I've rediscovered those kind of hidden gems on this album. And it just makes the album all the more stronger because I've grown to appreciate those kind of what we thought were lesser tracks back in 1981. And now it's like, man, this is just gold start to finish. Yeah. Yeah. I, I brought mine out too, because basically, um, you know, I uh, this was one of the ones I would have traded from you had you not picked it because it's a great example of this. It's one of the best examples of this, actually, right? Um, but uh, yeah, I could have I could have almost gone with hemispheres and permanent uh, permanent waves yeah. as well. Um, 
And, but, you know, I've often told people Signals is my favorite Rush album, and I think it kind of is. So there's, there's a great example, right? The uniformity of the songs across them. And, um, and yeah, Moving Pictures just has that, right? Yeah. And uh, it also has another thing that uh, some of these albums will have, and that's the cheating of having not very many songs on them, right? And that um, drives you to perfection, too. It's like, okay, well, you don't, you, don't have, you don't have that one ballad that screws it up or that one boring song or whatever, or that one you know, experimental song. It's like just a few songs. If they're all great, it makes the list, right? And that's another reason why Permanent Waves also is so great, right? Because even less songs. And I think that uh, a lot of the Rush albums that came like later in the 80s and certainly in the 90s, too many songs, right? But that's that's yeah. that. But that's more of the CD age as yeah. opposed to the bands themselves. Because even the bands were like, "All right, well, we can we can fit a lot more tunes on here. Let's just crank out a couple extra songs to fill up that disc, and then what do you got? That thing called filler, right? Yeah. We didn't really talk about filler a lot back in the day. We started talking about filler in the late '80s yeah. and the '90s and today, right? But back in the '70s, early '80s, I, I don't ever remember talking about filler songs. You know, there may be a may have been a song you didn't like that much because maybe the style you didn't like. But there, we never said, "Oh, they just kind of put that on there to fill out the you know the stuff of the album or whatever." We never talked about that back in the day. It's funny. I'm doing another one of these coffee table books for Weimar. We're doing a Nazareth one now, right? Nazareth, the visual biography. And, and I'm looking at all the quotes because we're sticking in quotes and stuff too. But the concept of filler back in the day was when you would put on more covers because you didn't have enough time to write anything because you were making, you know, the, the, the apocryphal two albums a year, which most people didn't do. They all think they did, but they didn't. Uh, but, you know, they, they talk about that. But I mean, they do what they did do a lot in the 70s was was just go off, go on the road, come back, make an album, go out on the road again. They work really, really long, you know, long hours. They work really hard. Right. Um, so, yeah, filler back in the day was a lot of covers. So the Nazareth guys, you can hear them talking about all through those records. We didn't really have much material. You know, and that's one of the reasons we put a cover on whatever, also because they were very successful with covers, right? But uh, oh, yeah, I was going to say, well, they were pretty damn good at doing covers. Yeah. They were one of those rare bands that, like, when they did a cover, you're like, all right, because they did it differently. Yeah. Right. It's not like today, a lot of these bands you hear today, they do a cover because they have nothing else to do. And the cover sounds exactly like yeah. the original. Nazareth would totally reconstruct those songs and make them their own to the yeah. point where you almost didn't even know it was, you know, a cover song and they pick songs that weren't like big famous songs so it's like you know like this flight tonight it's like you know unless you were into folk music would you have known that that was you know not an original song by nazareth probably not so yeah and that song influenced the writing of barracuda and that song also i i found a quote while while working on this book this week uh you know it, that song is what got roger glover the job to do the judas priest album and then they did the same thing on diamonds and rust yep right yep yeah, Perfect so example. Yep. I miss and rest, right? Okay. And then, uh, okay. So my next one. Um, all right. So uh, I actually don't have a copy of this anymore. I was horrified. To, I, I, I did this Metallica book. So I have, a, this was an illustrated history. And so there's a picture of it. Yeah. I don't know. I have my CDs gone. My, uh, my vinyl is gone. Um, Ride the lightning will be my third choice. And uh you know, this album uh, fits in a number of ways. Uh, it, the, the one way that this fits is that I think we're now in the theme of, uh, of bands who are think just like the fans. And this kind of started with Iron Maiden with seeing what they did with cover versions uh, and Metallica, what they did with cover versions. But the idea of these bands, you know, writing, uh, you know, starting with the new wave of British heavy metal where where you wanted to cover all the bases and you were thinking like a fan and, and you remember those albums that weren't perfect from your youth in your seventies. And you just wanted to make the whole thing perfect and, and cover all the bases and have no fat on it. Right. So, so ride the lightning is full of fast songs, slow songs, proggy songs, an entertaining instrumental, uh, a song in escape, which people used to say was a little bit commercially. Um, but I love it. I always loved it with that, you know, with that that shotgun snare thing that they they snuck in it. Uh, so you know, hook hookily, right? Um, and creeping death is an epic on there. Trapped under ice is is like your blue collar sort of working class thrash one on there. Fade to black. So here you go. So here's a band writing, um, you know, saying we're gonna put a ballad on, but it's gonna be entertaining to people, and it's gonna be dark and doomy, and it's gonna have a heavy part and all that. So never hated that song, right? So here you've got an album that has uh, eight tracks on it. Um, 
and uh, and and I think it, it's just well paced, well sequenced. It covers all the bases. Um, you're never bored. Uh, there, there's there's no fat. There's no long jammy parts. There's no uh, there's no you know pure ballad where there's no drums or anything like that. Um, and uh, and you know I I would say I would say. It, it more or less happens again on the next album, but I've always thought Master Puppets, even though it's often great, rated the, the greatest heavy metal album of all time, I often just think of it as, as Ride the Lightning 2. Um, so uh, there you go. I, I would say, I would say this, is, this is a record that, uh, that, again, the theme is they're thinking exactly like we would think as fans when putting together their record. Yep. And I mean, let's be honest, at that point in time, Metallica were fans, huge fans of metal in general. And uh, fast forward a decade and, and all of a sudden they're the biggest band in the world. And I think they forgot that. That's mm -hmm. something that they forgot along the way and circumstances, you know, dictated that. But yeah, they absolutely there. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why so many of us really fell in love with that band to begin with, because they were just like us. They were just young kids like all of us who loved all these great British bands and all and all the classic bands. They loved Purple and Sabbath and they they were just like us, but they were lucky enough to put to be in a band that was making great music. And uh, and I think you mentioned Blue Collar. I mean, that was that's perfect, right? They, they were the Blue Collar metal band. And we all really gravitated towards that back in the day. And I think that's what most of us really missed from this band once they became like enormous because yeah. they changed a little bit. Right. Uh, still, we're putting out some pretty good music, but it was it was a little bit different. And uh, I will also go on the record with saying that I also like Ride the Lightning just a little bit more than Master of Puppets. Cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to go to the opposite end of the spectrum here uh, for an album from 1972. Uh, this was another platinum album from this band. Uh, and I want to go back to Martin's comment from a couple of minutes ago, where you talk about uh, the economicalness of not having a lot of tracks on an album sometimes really works in the band's favor. So this particular album close to the edge, I mean, is a perfect example of that three songs. That's it. Yeah. Whoop, right. <laughs> Can't really go wrong there. But of course, you got to you got to fill up an album. Right. So here you've got the title track, which kicks off the album, which is basically, you know, all of side one on the vinyl, uh, 20, 20 odd minutes, right? Uh, a perfect, epic, progressive rock track that in its genesis, of course, was made up of all these other songs that they were working on that they somehow, along with Eddie Offord, their uh, engineer and producer, put it all together to make this one seamless prog rock epic that many people, myself included, um, consider one of the greatest prog rock songs of all time. And then over on side two, you've got another really long song and maybe close to 15 minutes. I'm forgetting exactly how long these tunes are. Uh, and You and I, which is absolutely gorgeous where you have the, the, the title track is this big kind of tumultuous, you know, constantly shifting, changing song that goes through all these, you know, wild adventures and explorations. And you and I is more like a pastoral thing, some gorgeous acoustic guitars, loads of Mellotron and keyboards, gorgeous vocals from, from John Anderson, a little bit different, but still just absolutely wonderful. And then they end it with this like sprightly upbeat rocker called Siberian Katru which is my favorite Yes song of all time. It's one of the great closers in all of rock history. And that, you know, I mean, you start off with that, that haunting Mellotron. I mean, it's just absolutely genius. And it's weird for an album with only three tracks, and let's face it, all of them pretty long, it goes by like that. Yeah. Where you put it on, and before you know it, it's done, and you're like, you're left wanting more. And it's one of those, I think, uh, albums that you can, as soon as it ends, you just want to play it all over again. It sounds great. Again, it's it's from its time. I mean, you listen to this album and you know you're talking about an early 70s album. But man, it's just, it, it doesn't get much better for this genre of rock music, prog rock. And I think all of these guys in this band were just masters of what they were doing. And this was, I mean, they were really, the band was really peaking at this point in time, you know, Bruford, and unfortunately this would be Bruford's last album with the band, uh, Chris Squire, Wakeman, Howe and Anderson, just a, a, a powerhouse band putting out their definitive statement in my book. I mean, they've got other really popular albums, but for me, this is, um, is if you're talking about a perfect album, doesn't get much better than this. 
Yeah, and often voted the greatest prog album of all time. Um, no, a lot of work went into all three of those songs. You're not talking about like, you know, sometimes these albums with very few songs will have a two minute. Steve, I, I'm Steve Howe and I wrote this little acoustic thing and there's no vocals on it, blah, 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 right? That kind of thing, right? So, so um, you know, every, everything on here is is just, you know, hugely constructed. I, I love your use of the word tumultuous for uh for, for close to the edge because that's exactly what that is it's like a, it's like a swirling cauldron of noise right it it's, shouldn't it's make so sense cool. but it does right yeah yeah, yeah. amazing amazing yeah <laughs> okay so um mine uh we're up to my number two right yep. okay so my number two pick is one that um uh when pete did not choose this this was on his list of 10 i went with it because i i think it's a great example of it's a great example of Ride the Lightning, actually. Um, but it, it's it's from an era where they, they aren't particularly writing for what the fans want. So like I say, that kind of started with, with the new wave of British heavy metal and Metallica, but they essentially made a Ride the, Ride the Lightning with this because uh, it has the one song that is the dirgy ballad with the heavy part in it beyond the realms of death everybody loves it it's a massive song they played it live all the time right um and uh and everything else on the record uh is is like ride the lightning filling in all sorts of cool things that's like say you want some metal like this you want some creative metal like this you want us to uh you know be proggy over here we'll do this you want a fast one uh so you get exciter which is you know that you know one of those proto thrash uh, discussion songs all the time um you even get a, a cover on here with Better By You, Better Than Me, which they completely, you know, pre it. Um, stained Class for a gallop, for a maiden gallop, right? Uh, Invaders, Awesome, White white Heat, Red Hot, everything on here. Uh, Saints in Hell, Savage was always one of my favorite priest songs of all time. Heroes End sounds like a song where they're kind of inverting the, the riff on it. So, um, yeah, you get, you get. Uh, nine songs on this thing, and uh, and uh, it's it's a great example of this concept you came up with, Pete. This idea of the perfect album. Uh, there's just there's just no letdown anywhere. Um, no songs where they're kind of phoning it in. It just sounds like a lot of thought has been put into everything, and it's not even my favorite Priest album. Um, I just did an episode of our The Contrarians show, and uh, I, I went on and on about Hellbent for Leather slash Killing Machine, or the other way around, if you want to be you know, in chronological time about it, right? Um, so that's my favorite Priest album. It always has been, but this is the one that fits uh, Pete's concept, You know, the idea of the perfect album from a band. There you go. Yeah, pain for me to give that one up, but you know, I mean, we had to, we, we were very seriously saying we just want to do five. Okay. Um, not saying we won't do another episode of this, but I mean, for, for this show, we wanted to discuss five. And so I basically put that up for lottery and uh, you know, but that, that would have, you know, if we were to do 10, that would easily would have been on the list because it totally fits this, what we're talking about here. It's a, just a great album. All right. My next one, uh, we're going to go to 1977. This one sold triple platinum um arguably my favorite album from this band although one of their other ones is right up there i, I often over the last 40 plus years have flip-flopped my top two with this band but uh i think it's one of those albums that um as much as i've always loved it i think i really appreciated it even more when I got to see the band play this album in its entirety back, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, something like that. And I realized, and again, it, if we go back to the moving pictures thing, uh, it's got a side that has all their bigger hits, okay, the really popular songs, and then a side that has the lesser known tracks. And to be able to see the band play those lesser known tracks and just like feel the impact and it makes you realize, wow, you know what? I think I might even like some of those lesser tracks as much, if not more, than the well-known songs. And I think that this album works so well from start to finish. It's accessible. It's heavy in spots. It's definitely really proggy. I'm um, talking about uh, The Grand Illusion by Styx. 
And I mean, it's just got it all. And the entire album is so memorable. I mean, the title track, Grand Illusion, we've all heard it. It's a radio anthem, right? Great song. Fooling Yourself, The Angry Young Man, that great Tommy Shaw of vocal and, and songwriting there. Uh, you got Superstars, Underrated, Gem on this album. Come Sail Away was the big hit, right? Uh, then you got Miss America, the James Young rocker, because almost every album uh, in this period, he would have like a big heavy rocker on there. But here's where it gets interesting. Then you got Man in the Wilderness, just absolutely gorgeous proggy song, Castle Walls, which is their big prog rock epic, one of my favorite songs from the band that you know most people don't even know. And then the big boisterous grand finale on here. And again, not a very long album. I mean, is this even 40 minutes? It's probably just under or thereabouts. Uh, and it just works on every level. And I can listen to this start to finish any day. And I, it gives me the warm and fuzzies. And, you know, again, I talked before about uh, the other album from this band that I might consider, uh, and that's uh, Pieces of Eight. But there is a track or two on Pieces of Eight that I'm like, all right, I can maybe skip on that. I'd never do it on this one. Mm -hmm. uh, just love it to death. Cool, yeah. Yeah, as kids, we we were we were such enemies of sticks. We hated sticks because they were like taking all the sales from all our, our favorite heavier <laughs> yeah. bands, right? And you know, the high voice and it just so many things rubbed us the wrong way as uh as you know, angry young adolescent metalheads, right? And just and just to see them be so successful. They had they had a very weird career where I think they have three triple three or four triple platinums in a row, um, which is which is an odd odd number to fall on um you know to have three in a row that are triple platinum i believe that's how it works and then and then you know buttressed by some you know golds and you know the the rise and then the fall but was like a massively successful band right yeah and you know the line from fooling yourself martin why should you be such an angry young man <laughs> <laughs> Right, exactly <laughs> well we both know from talking to dennis like dennis is so funny on that whole topic of of uh, hating and loving sticks right at, at the same time or or at one time or another right but yeah. he knows he knows that that band was hated by so many people right yeah well but it goes back to that whole thing of uh and a lot of bands were I wouldn't say guilty of this, but they maybe it's more radio kind of dictated this, that the radio stations would play their kind of sugary, more commercial songs. Uh, but for the people who didn't bother to investigate the albums because they didn't want to hear that kind of stuff, there's all these heavy, really rocking, in some cases, really proggy tracks on the albums. So yeah. people like, oh, sticks out of fucking babe song and you know paradise theater nonsense blah 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 and come sail away ah that band is so wimpy but then you listen to the rest of the album and it's like well maybe not really like that right maybe the complete opposite so you know i think radio oftentimes ruined a lot of these bands for a lot of people and they got these preconceived notions of what the bands were all about based on that popular single when in actuality i mean this came up on the mr sydney and i did the mr big show the other day you know mr big had these big massive ballad hits right but was that really what the band was all about but a lot of people would never listen to mr big because of you know I'm the one who wants to be right. But it's just, but that, cause that's what MTV and the radio dictated is what you should be listening to from this band. Yeah. So yeah. And growing up as a metal head, right. You're like, you shouldn't like sticks because I don't like that song. And I'm sure everything they do is like that, but in, in actuality, um, not necessarily the case. Yeah. And, and the critics don't like prog. The critics don't like hard rock. And also, you know, they got tagged with this corporate rock thing. And yes. part of that is is a little bit of the visual signal that they always kind of dressed a little upscale. Right. They, they looked like in, in their, you know, semi leisure suit look or whatever. Right. So they always looked a little uh, a little high class. Right. It's like, oh, we're better than you or whatever. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. So so the idea that. Um, you know, they're not, they're not down and dirty in the, in the Bowery and Max's Kansas city and all this, and they're from the Midwest and all this stuff. Right. So there's all these signals that, uh, that the critics wouldn't like about something like that. And the same thing at, that we felt as metalheads, the jealousy of, of seeing them sell so many records where our favorite bands weren't selling as many records. Yeah. You're not going to confuse sticks with motorhead. Right. And yeah, you know, yeah. motorhead, they're the working class, you know, yeah grimy guys and putting out all these great albums that nobody buys it's like, well why can't motorhead get a quarter of the sales of sticks what's wrong with this world right yeah yeah, yeah. all right so uh so my number one pick um by the way uh i brought this up because i almost went with this this is this would be have been an oddball pick this is the water boys with this is the sea um one of my favorite bands of all time and just like one of these epic 
beyond you two like messiah type bands with this, these walls of acoustic guitars and and huge phil specter instrumentation and all that but i just uh, i thought of this when when you came up with this concept because i've often rated this in my top five albums of all time so i just thought i mentioned that but it, but it'd be an oddball choice that a lot of people wouldn't wouldn't kind of know much about um but my number one pick um is this one here people i have heard of this record it's, oh, yeah. it's something a, a few people have heard about um it's by a little uh, little band from australia called acdc uh and i often do not pick this as my favorite acdc album of all time i often go with power age but um Again, that might be a little bit because of just the mystique of the whole package of Power Age, just the whole idea of, you know, I got the red vinyl at the time and it was 78 and the and the and the raw production on it and stuff and and even some of the mellowness uh, to it, um, the simplicity. But but this record um, has always been really close with that one for favorite album. But but I just I just look at the tracks on here and, uh, you know, right off the bat. My favorite ACDC songs of all time have always included Walk All Over You, Touch Too Much, and If You Want Blood, and Almost Beaten Around the Bush. Um, but I totally love Highway to Hell, totally love Girls Got Rhythm. As kids, uh, the two that we liked the least or the three were Get It Hot, Love Hungry Man, and Night Prowler. But Night Prowler is now my favorite slow bluesy ballad from this band. Um, I always liked, liked it. Um, but, you know, it beats the likes of Ride On and the Jack and those kinds of things for me. But Shot Down in Flames was a, was a great workman-like mid-heavy song for them. Girls Got Rhythm is kind of the same thing. I just look at this whole album and, uh, and I would not skip anything on here. Um, it's just the greatest celebration of life, I think, from ACDC. The most well put together. This is Mutt Lang, but it's before he got strange and obsessive with with different sounds i mean it, it's it's basically a conservative sounding album but it's their most professional to date uh, by 1979 ten, you know 10 tracks so they they weren't they weren't going to beat your criteria by by having few tracks on here they had to get through all 10 with all 10 of them having some level of magnetism to it and and i think that totally happened so i i had no problem picking this as uh, as one of my picks there you go yeah, I think uh, you could arguably say this maybe, we'll see by the comments of this video, but there's probably two, maybe three ACDC albums that could be picked by many people on here. I think certainly Back in Black is going to get picked by a lot of people, I think. Um, and yeah, definitely that album. I, that's that's probably the one I would pick as well. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I really don't like rock and roll ain't noise pollution. And there's one or two other ones on there. I'm not. I, I, I'm, I agree with it. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a couple on there. You know, they, they they do this thing where they experiment with with directions that just kind of rub you the wrong way once in a while. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Power Age would have been close. I, I don't know. I don't know if I would find too many others. Flick of the Switch is a huge favorite for me. Yeah. But this is a band that 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 it that kind of defaults into your concept of this perfect album because you know everything is is in a pretty tight range of what they're gonna do on it. So if you're if you're into that tight range, you may find an album with nine or ten tracks that you yeah. And, and again, like for me, like Let There Be Rock might arguably be my favorite ACDC album. But again, is it perfect? No, mm -hmm. not quite. Not quite. Almost. All right. All right. So uh, my number one choice, I'm, I think there's probably a couple people who have heard this album. A couple meaning probably like at least 25 million, right? Uh, this album came out in 1976. And uh, I had a discussion about this album on another show recently where it's probably arguably the album that I've heard the most in my life, not just from me playing the album or the CD, but almost every single song on this album at one point in time was probably played on the radio at least a little bit, right? And I'm talking about uh, the debut from Boston. Yeah. Uh, I never get tired of this. And this is for me, probably one of the greatest feel good albums of all time, whereas it's so familiar, but in a good way. And it's, it's fairly heavy in spots. It's very commercial. Uh, the musicianship is top notch. The production is stellar. I love everything about it from the vocals to the guitar tones, the solos, the rhythms. I mean, you got 
a couple slower tunes, some heavy songs. You got a kick-ass instrumental. I mean, more than a feeling, peace of mind, foreplay, long time, rock and roll band, smoking, hit your ride, something about you, and let me take you home tonight. And even like Let Me Take You Home Tonight, which is probably my least favorite song of the album, still is a really cool kind of ballad tune, right? It's just, it's really singable, really melodic. And, uh, you know, you got that memorable album cover, which I remember, I don't know about you, Martin, when I saw this, on the racks in the in the record store back in the day. I mean, I've always loved like uh, obviously you know guitars. It's a guitar spaceship. I've loved spaceships and sci-fi and all that kind of stuff. And that this just totally like, you know, I mean, come on, doesn't get much better than that. And then the cool album pick of the guys, right? But it's just it's a perfect album. And I think when we were discussing doing this show, this automatically was my number one, the first one I thought of, and it just went right to the top of the list and I just have never ever gotten sick of anything on here and even though more than a feeling is probably the most played song on this and I don't I can't imagine there's a person on this planet that has not heard that song I don't mind hearing it still to this day whereas songs like you know rock and roll or stay where to heaven or hotel california or you know the other handful of suspects when I hear them I'm like oh I'm not in the mood to hear that more than a feeling I still would be like yeah that's all right for the 1598th time that's okay right so interesting yeah i mean we just did or i did a uh, episode of history in five songs uh which was about ranking the zeppelin catalog a fresh new way and and ranking them in in the context of the times and and i think i had presents worst because of this idea in 1976 they were being lapped by so many people i thought and, and you know aerosmith rocks is a g- great example of that sad wings is an example but that boston album absolutely an example because as you say when you listen to more than a feeling subconsciously you're going wow this was really good this was well put together for 1976 the production the performances everything about it there was so much work put into it um and yeah, I, I remember. I remember as a kid, like like that was one of the first few bands that we liked that wasn't particularly crazy heavy because the guitar tone was so uncompromising, right? That was really heavy um, for the time. Even even it, if it was put in the context of a pop song, uh, that was an extreme extreme uh, use or version of of distortion. Um, that that you would get so it so it, it went from boston it went from sticks to boston to foreigner that that kind of getting into it and then yeah. as you get to be a player then it then you move into prog right then it was yes and, and genesis and stuff like that yeah. right but uh yeah wow yeah you can't you can't deny that record and what a what a massive seller it was too so <laughs> arguably the greatest debut album of all time for a like kind of hard rock band yeah yeah yeah, I, I think uh, it, it often would win that kind of a poll, you know, and an overrated one that kind of uh, gets in there that we've often talked about is Appetite for Destruction, you know, that just keeps selling and selling and selling and just it, its legend keeps growing and growing. And then, uh, you know, Van Halen, Montrose always get mentioned as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Ooh, Montrose. Hmm. Pretty close that one, right? I, I thought I, about I, that record. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it falls down a little on good rocking tonight for me, but but even that is, is pretty darn yeah. good. Yeah, <laughs> fodder for a part two, I say. Hmm. Interesting. So uh, this was a really cool concept and episode. And uh, if you guys really would like to see a part two, I am game. Martin, are you game? I think so. I yeah. think so. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we, we've got something else in store for you next week, everybody. But I would have no issue with revisiting this in two weeks uh, because I since we kind of finalized our list a couple days ago, I have thought of a couple others uh, and easily can do another five. So um, so let us know in the comments below if you want to see a part two of this. We're all for it. Uh, but I'm going to divulge our next week's show. So we've often been asked by a lot of our viewers, well, what about like your favorite like greatest hits or compilation albums and i you know what i'm one of those guys that have been guilty throughout my life of like you know gravitating towards a couple songs i heard on the radio by a band and just going out and buying the greatest hits set and enjoying it and then realizing that the band has a lot more really good songs other than there and chucking the greatest hits set and going out and buying the catalog but there are others that i have bought that greatest hits set and honestly, over the years, I realized that's really all I need. So what we're going to talk about next week, and not necessarily those greatest hits albums per se, but what are those, I think we 
five, right? We talked about five. Yeah. Who are those five bands or artists where all these years later, we still say, yeah, all I ever need is that greatest hits collection. So that's what we're going to talk about. So those those greatest hits bands or artists where that, that compilation set fully suffices and we don't need to investigate the catalog any further. So that's coming or, or to frame it a little bit differently, the idea that um, the hits are, are you know, they, they kind of fall in our list of the favorite songs by these bands. Yeah, it's the cream of the crop, in other words. It, it, yeah. the hits. That, that's the stuff I like the most, right? And then, yeah. and then it falls down. There, yeah. yeah, exactly. The cream of the crop, right? So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the cream of the crop, but it wasn't the label that picked it or whatever, right? That, right. And forced it down your throat by by making that single and making it the radio song, right? It's yeah. this is almost like you agree with the label choices. Yeah, this is their best stuff. There really isn't anything else that quite measures up to this. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's there's plenty of those, I think. But uh, I've already got a couple of my that I've been jotting down so so that's coming up next friday a week from today so stay tuned for that and then if you guys want to see it we'll do part two of this perfect album in two weeks so uh martin uh talk about that angel book oh yeah yeah so yesterday i got a got a, a small reprint in of the angel book where i think i might have copied it here i should have wanted to show this too this, this was actually kind of cool too this came in the mail yesterday uh my buddy uh who runs a, a, a company called Denfire down in Brazil. These are three of my books that just came out in Brazil in Portuguese. So we got the, uh, the first of the maiden, the first of the priest, and he's doing turbo till now as well. And, and the merciful fate, which is now in five languages, this merciful. Wow, very it's cool. Done really well, but yeah, so I, I got in yesterday, uh, a small reprint. This has been out of print, uh, the, the angel book. It went out of print pretty fast. So I got 150 more copies of that. So martinpopoff.com if you uh, need an angel book. Cool. Any updates on the Uriah Heat book? Uh, yeah, I've proofed it. It's uh, it's all approved now. Now it goes to print. So it should be a month, month and a half, two months, something like that. They, they get made in Turkey. They, they go to the UK, then they come to me. So it's uh, it, it goes on a, on a world trip before, uh, before I have any of them. And like I say, we're working on the Nazareth one right now. All right. Well, you got to make sure to set aside one copy each of both of those because right. that's mandatory purchasing for me. So as soon as it comes in, you got to have that little Pardo shelf there. Right? Set aside for Pete, right? And <laughs> automatically take one out and put it yeah. there. I'll PayPal you. We'll be all done. So, all right. There you have it, everybody. This was uh, loads of fun. So uh, let's hear what your favorite uh, or, you know, what your perfect albums are. And like I said, I'm already, I'm going to start putting together my list for uh, eventual part two of this. Hopefully we'll do it in two weeks and uh, stay tuned for our greatest hits episode uh, next week. And uh, for Martin Popoff, I am Pete Pardo. See you all later. Have a good weekend.